Take a minute to answer these questions. Who belongs in jail? The violent, the addicted, the repeat offender? When is prison the right punishment? And then how should we treat those we sentence to prison? Should we provide job training, educational classes, and access to books or computers? What is the goal of prison? To reform the prisoner or punish? Should we be preparing them, the ex-offender, with skills to keep them from returning to prison when they're released, when they, they pay their debt to society? The person sitting next to you may answer these questions very differently because Americans don't agree on what we mean by justice, do we? And if you're a Christian, your version of mercy may be more like tough love. Tonight we'll talk to a national leader on the topic of crime and punishment. With criminal justice reform on the front burner, you need to hear this conversation. Stay with us. In the late 1700s, Pennsylvania Quakers had an idea. There was a better way to change the behavior or rehabilitate criminal offenders than beating or whipping the offender. They would instead place the criminal in a cell to pray, to reflect, to separate from evil. The building created to produce a repentant heart was called a penitentiary. And since the beginning of the system, reform-minded citizens like the Pennsylvania Prison Society have been making sure that society's obligation to treat prisoners humanely was carried out. In Pennsylvania, the Department of Corrections oversees over two dozen correctional institutions, has 15,000 employees and some 50,000 inmates. From 2011 to 2021, one man was at the top of the department, Secretary John Wetzel, appointed by a Republican governor and remarkably retained by his Democratic success successor. He's back in the private sector and with us here on State of Independence, and it's a privilege to have him on the program today. God bless you, brother. So glad to have you with us. Oh, I'm blessed to be here. Thank you so much. It's yeah. a great opportunity. I, I can't wait to talk yeah. uh, about this to your listeners. Yeah, yeah. So, so tell, tell the folks about you, a little about you, um, about... You probably didn't start out as a kid saying, you know, one day I want to be Secretary of Corrections for the state of Pennsylvania. Tell, tell us how you started. Well, I actually uh, started in, uh, in the foster system, uh, believe it or not. I was born as a, uh, in uh, Williamsport, Pennsylvania as a byproduct of uh, a biracial, inappropriate, inappropriate at the time relationship. So put in the foster system, adopted by... Uh, Pennsylvania Dutch family, actually. So I grew really? up in Lebanon County. I mean, other than that, pretty normal, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, but but did actually, you ever meet your uh, get to know who your birth parents were? I actually uh, have met my met my sister about a year and a half ago. We we're uh, best friends. She's actually the the tough one of the two. I'm the sensitive one, believe it or not. Uh, she's a partner in a law firm, labor law, but um. Yeah, so I, I, you know, I grew up um, in a very, you know, I was the only uh, black person there. Um, and so actually, if any, if there was any thought about corrections, it was probably being in corrections. I mean, I was on juvenile probation, you know, and, and uh, really wouldn't have guessed coming out of high school that I'd, um, that I would have been the longest serving uh Secretary in the history of corrections, especially given the fact that corrections in America started right here in Philadelphia. Yeah, exactly. You know? um, did you play sports? I did. I played football and I went to Bloomsburg University. Shout out to my Huskies. Um, went to Elko High School where I went, I'm back coaching now. Uh, watch them Raiders. Shout out. For what position you play? In I played offensive line. That's where all the smart guys play in yeah. football. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, you know, in football, for me, football education, these were these were difference makers. This is what made the difference between me you know, serving time in a prison and, and, you know, arguably being one of the most important voices in corrections over the last decade and, and to this day. How did, you, how did you get there? You finished college, you played football. I didn't college. finish college. I quit college, actually. Wow. Um, you know, didn't, didn't everybody? <laughs> so I played football in college, um, really lived my life to play football and then quit school after my last game. I went to be a part-time correctional officer. I went to be a full-time correctional officer. I was actually a part-time correctional officer in college. Um, my brother was a full-time correctional officer at Lebanon County, and he said, hey, we have part-time jobs, so I went to do part-time to offset, like I didn't have money for college, right? So it's student loans, and then <clears throat> student loans cover some, and then books, and my parents didn't have money to contribute to me. So I was working from the time I graduated. Fortunately, during high school, they said if you played sports, you didn't have to 
work, but I had to find a way. So I was a part-time correctional officer. I quit Path of Least Resistance. I was a correctional officer full-time for nine years and then um, had, a, had a moment that uh, one of my advisors, Dr. Eileen Astersetson, predicted where, you know, I was going to realize that I was working far below my potential. And it happened working on a block, and I won't get into details at this point, but, you know, working in corrections is not always an easy job. And I, I realized that I needed to go back to school. And I had a really cool thing happen. I, had to t- I went back and took 18 credits, got all A's. I raised my GPA to a respectable level, which needed some help. And um, I took a psych religion course, and I actually wrote a, read a book uh, by Viktor Frankl called Man's Search for Meaning. It changed my life. It's a book that changed my life. Wow. And um, in it, he talked about the experience as a Jewish person in a Holocaust prison. And now, now think about, when you think about incarceration in America, it's, it's a choice. You opt into incarceration. Sure, it's, there's disparities. Either way, they're not walking into church and pulling people out of the pew for sick it yeah. out, of, out of tune, right? You still put yourself in a position where even if you're falsely accused, and I'm not minimizing that, uh, again, you weren't sitting in the church when you were falsely accused, right? So either way, you got to make some adjustments on your end. But in, in the case of, of, of folks in the, during the Holocaust, they, they were just Jewish, yeah. right? Yeah. And so rather than just be broken by this experience, this psychologist, Victor uh, F- Frankl, observed his fellow prisoners. And, he, and, and in reading this, and my interpretation as someone who's worked in corrections forever, I'm reading this book and I see, he says, when people first come in, they experience shock and disbelief. And I flash back as a correctional officer to work in booking and seeing people like looking around, like, where am I at? How did I get here? You know, and, and when you look at statistics around incarceration, you see the high risk period for suicide is 72 hours and, and this and that. It's like, wow, it's, I can't believe it's happening. The second phase is the one that really drew the analogy, and and he called that emotional death. And what he described was was people who he knew in the community who, who, who went into this circumstance, and the circumstance changed who they were to their core. And they died emotionally, and they behaved in manners that weren't consistent with who they were. You could describe today's politics the same way. I mean, 100%. These are people who, I mean, people I know who I've grown up with are like, Wait, where is this coming from? And then the third part that I took from that is he described what happened when people were emancipated or released. And, and there, were three, uh, there were three paths that he, he generally observed. And one was people who left and never looked back and just blocked it. And I get that. And I'd probably be in that category. Or I'd be in a second category of those who turned around and and extracted revenge on those who did it. Mm-hmm. And I'd, I'd probably, actually I'd probably be more likely in that category. But the third category were people who were, who were made better by this experience, you know. And to me, that, that's really what kept me in corrections. I went back and got my degree to get out of corrections. I read that book and decided I need to be in corrections. I got my degree in 98, 90, uh, I, I became a counselor the next year head of the counseling department the next year, head of the training academy at all at Berks County in Reading mm-hmm. um, the next year. The next year I was appointed as the third youngest warden in the history of Pennsylvania, Franklin County, mm-hmm. uh, Chambersburg, mm-hmm. um, a very uh, conservative, it's, in the, it's the Bible Belt of Pennsylvania, you know, and spent 10 years there and had just a great, I mean, listen, the people there embraced the notion that people who were incarcerated were our neighbors and sometimes, um, what what they did requires them to go to jail or state prison to to serve their punishment. Their punishment is to be removed for society because they didn't follow our rules or our mores. But it doesn't diminish their humanity, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. so, I always believe that our how we treat people in in prisons and jails is more reflective of us. Mm-hmm. And we certainly can treat them however we want because nobody looks, and frankly, nobody. Uh, a bunch of people don't care about what happens mm-hmm. in there, but it, but we should. And if we claim to be Christians, right? Mm-hmm. When when you were in, when I was in prison, uh, you visited me, that's right? Correct. That's correct. Not not the other way around. We right. forget that, right? right? We right. forget that. It's well, not that, the other way around. That's exactly right. I mean, that that's in in Matthew. You know, that when when, we're, when our lives are judged, that's one of the questions. You know, like when I was sick and in prison. You know, you visited me to those. Well, who's who, visiting? Yeah. Like yeah. Who's care? Forget yeah. visit. Just care. Just say, yeah. 
just say to your local officials, well, we should know what's going on in there. Right. So, so you, you obviously self-identify as a Christian person. Is there a journey to you becoming a Christian person? Is it something that you were raised in a... So I was, bo- I was born in, uh, well, who knows what yeah. I was born in, right? Yeah. But I was raised in a, a conservative Lutheran church in um, Lebanon, Pennsylvania, St. Matthew's on Lehman Street. <laughs> and uh, my, my parents, uh, we, we weren't allowed to miss church. If we went to vacation, which for us was eerie, mm-hmm. <laughs> which I, you know, I'm not hating on eerie, trust me. I, I saw uh, Senator Laughlin uh, show the view of the Maui of Pennsylvania, and I'm all in on the hashtag Maui <laughs> in Pennsylvania. But um, we'd, we'd go to a church there. Actually, uh, my parents lived there for a little bit, and there was a pastor, I remember, even remember his name, Wayne Loophole, um, who we would go and see. And then um, when I turned 18, I didn't have to go to church anymore. So I'd spent a, a fair amount of time away. And when I went to Franklin County, I really wanted to find a faith community. Raised, I have four daughters, so I raised my daughters in. And um, I became an Orthodox Christian. I met a, prof- uh, a professor and, and priest named Father Ted Pulcini. He a, was a professor at Dickinson and just fell in love with the religion. I mean, um, I'm, some would think I'm very forward thinking, uh, but I, I like the traditional, I mean, we, we Orthodox claim that, you know, our traditions track back to the apostles and that I really resonates with me and the lessons. I named my company after that. Phronima is like um, a, 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 a Greek, so in, 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 the, in the Orthodox Church, we believe there's not just the, the Bible, but there's also tradition with a big T, the, the stories that were passed down. And in order to learn them, you have to understand them in the time that they were shared. To understand the Bible, you have to understand what it was like for Jesus walking the earth. That's the way I approach public policy and especially criminal justice. These people are vulnerable, they're, they're damaged, uh, they've done some horrible things in some time. And, you know, as Christians, I think we're, we're really tasked to, to put that behind and find the little, you know, so shiny yeah, part. Christians are on both sides of the issue. I mean, you have Christians well, who, 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 who will say, you know, you need to be hard on crime and punish these offenders. You know, for instance, if you live in, in a city like Philadelphia and you see some of the horrific crime that takes place, you know, just the other day, uh, a person in downtown Philadelphia was beaten and stomped until they became unconscious. And by a two, group of people. actually, within five hours. Wow. Yeah, within two blocks, Center wow. City, yeah. 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 7.30 was the yeah. second one, yeah. These very, are horrific stories. Yeah. And, and, and Christians, like everybody else, watch these stories and, 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 and then react to them. And there are some folks who say, well, you know, you need to, certainly the people who did this, they need to be dealt with. Uh, that they need, they need to be brought to answer for what they, they did and to tell why they did what they did. And, 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 and pay the price for it. And then there are others that say, but at the same time, while they need to be punished for what they did, we can't discontinue loving them. We've got to care about them, even though what they did is horrible. And obviously, if you were the person that got stomped, you know, it would take a lot of love in your heart to say, you know what, I forgive you for beating me up on the street and stomping me till I was unconscious. But that being said, the attitude of Christian people is supposed to to even love those who are in prison. Not everybody who's in prison has done something violent, and not everybody, as you said, who's in prison actually is guilty. There, there are people, sadly, who end up in prison for one reason or the other. They may have been in the wrong place at the wrong time, or they may have been falsely accused and found guilty by a peer, by, by a jury of their peers, but they, they actually didn't commit the crime because we see people who get released after years in prison. Uh, but but Christians fall on all sides of that, you know, especially like the death penalty issue, you know, uh, whether or not, is there compassion for somebody who, who kills somebody else or, or do they deserve to be put to death? And, and the states differ from state to state on, 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 on where and what you do. As, as an Orthodox Christian person, you know, how, how do you, how do you, how do you deal with that, and, and what do you think? Is, and you're, you're not just a, a Christian person who's thinking about this. You're the longest-serving Secretary of Corrections in, 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 a, in, a, in an important state. Uh, that's a, that's a, a big deal. So you're a thought leader in this area as well. But, but tell us how you respond to all that. Yeah, I don't know how you'd figure it out without a moral compass brought by my faith. And I think when you, when you, you use the moral compass and, and you're not <clears throat> fettered by some political lens or some bias. It's really simple. There's nothing 
that's mutual. There's nothing inconsistent about holding those people who built, who beat these innocent people, have them incarcerated for a, a proper amount of time. There's this notion called uh, parsimony, right, or parsimony, where where the the punish should f punishment should fit the crime, but punishment should be there. But, you know, I, I said earlier, you know, I was in prison and you, and you visited me. Ostensibly, he was in prison for something he did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? There was nothing that yeah, precludes yeah, going yeah, to prison. Yeah. But how we treat people hmm. and, and understand. And here's what, what, what I think Christians need to understand. The path to prison is not just somebody who says, I want to go to prison today. The path to prison is littered with addiction. It's littered with trauma. You know, Pennsylvania did, and still I hope on the website, although, you know, they, they as soon as you leave, your history is gone. Yeah. You know, the, the king is gone, along with the king, or in this case, the queen. And, and good luck to Laurel Harry, who's our new secretary of corrections. And I'm sure she's going to do a great job. She was uh, appointed by Josh Shapiro. She actually I promoted her superintendent at, at Camp Hill. So I'm I'm really rooting for her. Um, but but the fact remains that, you know, we have people who, who are incarcerated are human beings. Mm. And 89% um, of the people, of the 890 plus individuals in Greaterford, right down the road, <clears throat> that we assessed for exposure to trauma, had an exposure to trauma. And unresolved trauma in children is what's called an adverse childhood experience. And, and it leads to when unresolved to the kinds of things we see, behavior issues, this and that. You add on in poor urban communities, exposure to lead, right? Which impacts the prefrontal cortex, as does uh, exposure to trauma, exposure to um, gunshots, right? All these things impact the prefrontal cortex in a really scary way for these kids. One, they still know the difference between right and wrong, but they have a different difficulty in controlling those impulses. And so it's an actual fact where you can have people who are living in the same environment, exposed to the same thing, and one individual happens to have a community to plug into that helps mitigate the impact of these trauma, right? And then let's not even start talking about the education experience. So what, what yeah, the prisoners are disproportionately poorly educated. They'll probably listen. The average rating reading level for someone who comes into a state prison in Pennsylvania is eighth grade. The average rating level from someone who comes from a state prison from Philadelphia is third grade. Wow. I mean, I, I we did a we didn't do a study because we didn't publish it, but we looked at at what school districts um, can had the most number of people incarcerated, and if you took the the um, at the time, if you took the 25 worst performing school districts by whatever measure, they were in the top 20 of, of school districts that we had people incarcerated. There, there's no question about, about the path to incarceration. Uh, poor education experience, not having a pro-social support network. Faith communities are real obvious choices. When I was in Franklin County, we spent a lot of time engaging with faith communities to volunteer in our jails, but I had one requirement. If you're going to volunteer in jails, don't don't have someone come out of jail and come to your church and act like they can't be there. Right, <laughs> you know? right. And so what we what people really need is the same thing that you and I and everybody. I know people say I pull myself up from the bootstraps. Yeah, somebody helped you. Yeah. And in some yeah, cases, right. you know, some of these guys, you know, I don't know who said it, but some of these guys sitting on third base and think they had trouble. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know? Hey, if you were born on third base, buddy, you just just born on third base. Right. You still gotta get home, right, right? right? And some of them end up on second base, right? right. right. <laughs> so the opposite is also true true. What I've seen my whole life is we have so much untapped human potential when you talk about work, when you talk about anything. And when we expose people like me, who when finally I got exposed to education at Bloomsburg and Elko, got exposed to positive people and grew up, you're not only, you're not only equal, but exceed. And then I felt a responsibility to stay in corrections for 32 years. Yeah, yeah. Like who would stay in state government for 10 years? <laughs> Cabinet level. <laughs> When we come back, I'll ask John about ways to help ex-offenders. What or who does a person leaving prison need to succeed? It's an answer I know many of you want to hear. Stay with us. You're watching Joe Watkins' State of Independence on Lighthouse TV, positively different. Share your comments about today's program in the comment box at joewatkins.org. We're talking to Secretary John Wetzel 
the longest serving Secretary of Corrections in the state of Pennsylvania history, and we're just delighted to have him. He's a Christian person, which is uh, especially important. Uh, Secretary, th the question I, I, I think we all want is, how, how do we support people and people come out of prison? You made a great point, you know, don't say you want people to come to your church and then when they come there, you treat them like they have leprosy, you know, like you don't want them there. Um, how, do, how do people who self-identify as Christian, that's a lot of people, but, but how do we better support people when they come out of prison? And, and I, I would tell you that the churches in Pennsylvania have been remarkable, <laughs> honestly, engaging. I mean, my, in my little 300 bed jail in, in Franklin County, we had probably more volunteers than we had incarcerated people, right? Wow. And, and when you think about what someone needs to be successful coming out of prison or jail, um, part of it, you have to understand the path there, right? So we talk right. about uh, addiction. We, we haven't talked about mental health issues, but yeah. what you need to know about the state prison population, we talked about undereducation. About 40% of the people who come in prison don't have a high school diploma. Right. Education is first. Right. Young black men in America who drop out of school, 70% lifetime incarceration rate. That's a gap. We have to close the education gap, yeah. right? We have to really understand and get someone up to their aptitude wh wherever they're at, yeah. right? Second thing we have to do, the, think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? They need yeah. a place to live. They need food. They need a way to survive. And, and So are there are people that say, well, you know, I'll, I'll help somebody, but there's a time limit on it. So like they come out of prison, I'll help them for a few months, but you know, after two or three months, and what you're talking about is, you know, are, are pretty significant challenges. So you, well, you take somebody who's had trauma, somebody who's severely undereducated, maybe while they were in prison, they didn't improve their reading level. They didn't improve, they didn't work on those skills. So they went into prison not being able to read very well. They came out of prison, they still don't read very well. And, and, and now they have a prison record, uh, which they have to carry with them. Um, do you, what do you say to people who say, well, you know, I'll give, me, I'll give you three months, I'll help you for three months, I'll help you for, for a month or whatever. I mean, people need a longer, it would seem to me that a prisoner coming out would probably need a longer period of time since what got them there happened over the course of maybe a lifetime. They might, they might need some significant time to get back on their feet, or, or is that not realistic? Yeah, um, I think you hit on a couple of things. Let me let me first say it like this. If I was dying of thirst and you put one drop of water, yeah, right. I'd be pretty appreciative yeah. of that one drop of water. So if it gets me to tomorrow or next week, that's cool. But I think uh, uh, I think you should think about it like this. Um, yeah, people need a hand uh, a hand up, right? So if you're an employer and you give someone a job um, and you really want to help someone coming out of prison, Give them a job and give that, make that giveaway, because that job, they're giving you something back. Make that giveaway, uh, mentoring or casework or the kind of thing where folks just need the same thing you and I needed. Um, we did a really cool study in uh, 2009, actually before I became Secretary of Corrections, Brett Buckland, our, uh, our head of, of research, did a study and looked at people on probation or, or parole who um, succeeded and compared them to those who didn't. And I think this gets to the heart of it. Now, you mentioned work, I mentioned housing, we mentioned a bunch of things. Do you know what the one factor was that differentiated those two groups? I won't make you guess. The group that succeeded had someone they could specifically identify as a mentor. Wow. So oftentimes we think that, pe that groups of people need certain things. And we don't do this thing that is a really good idea when we have a group of people who need something. We don't ask them what they need. Yeah. And we don't. Uh, take a look at the, the people in that group who are successful and try to figure out what's been successful for them and, and how to replicate that. And, and in this case, um, just being willing to interact with someone uh, pre while they're incarcerated and then follow them in the community and pick up the phone at night. Let me give, let me give your viewers one just real world scenario. I'm someone who's struggling and I need money. I have to pay the bills. I have kids, this and that, and I need to get money. You call me and I'm going to hustle, use my network, call people and maybe get you into a day labor place or something and find an appropriate path for you to pay the bills, even if I don't give you money. Or you call someone from your old life and you find a quick way to do it. Right. So, so anybody who has a sincere interest, a Christian who has a sincere interest, um, there, let me tell you how you spell love, T-I-M-E. Yeah, time. Everybody has that, right? Amen, brother. Thank you.
Thank you. Our thanks to Secretary Wessel for his service to the Commonwealth and for the, doing the hard work of balancing justice with mercy. We'll be right back with some closing thoughts with our great producer, Jeff Coleman. Learn more about Joe Watkins and the mission of this program at joewatkins.net. And tell Joe what you thought about today's program in the comment box. And now let's talk to our great producer, Jeff Coleman. Well, I think this may have been one of the most important shows that we've done. Um, because it, if, if you're sitting there watching this program tonight, you've, you've been taking notes, I hope, about how do we look at people who are no longer in the, our company. And we just know, maybe the barber shop, maybe you know, at church and somebody is away. We don't often know how to deal with that. Yeah, yeah. But what was really encouraging is John's talking about this little prison in Franklin County, um, more volunteers than prisoners. Every one of our prisons in Pennsylvania needs to be surrounded by a community that says, hey, when, when you come back uh, and you make it right, we're here for you. Well, he made a great point early on when he said, uh, you know, people forget that, you know, in, in the scriptures it says, I mean, that, that, in what, black and white, in black and white, it says, yeah. you know, when I was sick and in prison, you visited me. Yeah. And, and, and that's kind of like an expectation of people who, who proclaim to follow Christ, you know, that they would take time to visit people who are either sick or in prisons. And, and, and sad to say, I mean, there are, there are lots of churches that have no plan, no yeah. program, that don't encourage. Sending a check isn't enough. No, it's not. And uh, the idea that we would allow any distance between people who are struggling with, with addiction, who are struggling with with any of the uh, the issues that he he outlined, or say that somehow that wouldn't happen to us, uh, your uh, the conversation about this the the cerebral cortex, yeah, that was fascinating to yeah, me yeah. because you're thinking about um, reacting to situations differently. If if you have a supportive family, if you have good nutrition in the morning, if you slept on a bed and, and didn't have a lot of siblings crammed in a room, maybe your reaction to that interruption of your day is going to be different uh, than the negative reaction that landed you in jail. These, all these little micro moments, but I, uh, I hope people share this program, go into our YouTube channel and share this program uh, because I think it's a pretty important conversation. He talks about you know, taking time with people, you know, having patience and yeah. love in your heart for them. I thought that T-I-M-E, was... T-I-M-E. Yeah, yeah. It was great. That's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. In the Gospel of Matthew, there's a warning about those who forget those outside societies. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Maybe tonight's conversation with Secretary Wetzel was a reminder for someone in your life who fits that description, a neighbor or a stranger in need, maybe a family member right now. If that is the case, I'd love to hear from you. Send me a direct message in the comment box at joewatkins.org. From our studios here in Philadelphia, America's First Capital, I'm Joe Watkins. For Jeff Coleman and our team here at Lighthouse TV, thanks so much for watching. Powerful words from the Secretary. Really powerful words. Yeah. We had a Christian Secretary of Corrections for 10 years, and his words to us right now just ring so true. Kind of back to the main idea. Yeah, yeah. But better. Yeah, but much better. Yeah. Oh, great conversation. Yeah. Joe Watkins' State of Independence is a production of Lighthouse TV, positively different. Made possible in part because of the support of viewers like you.